Coming up on Digital Music Trends 193, recorded on the 23rd of July 2014, Facebook's save function, Spotify to IPO or not to IPO, Ultra vs Michelle Fan and related content ID issues, Senzari's music graph, Samsung's Beatsy headphones, the iTunes festival and much more! Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio and a video show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcasting apps, uh, YouTube SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many many more. And if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out uh, please do sign up on bit.ly slash DMT list or head on to the website at digitalmusictrends.com and you'll find all the links there. And uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome Ralph Christoph, the co-founder and now head of strategy at the CEO Pop Festival and Convention in Cologne. So hi Ralph and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Hi, hi good morning. Everything's good. Thank you. It's uh, great to have you and uh, it's also a real pleasure to welcome uh, Darren Hemmings, uh, co-founder of digital marketing agency Mo- uh, Motive Unknown on MotiveUnknown.com. So hi uh, Darren and thanks for joining me. How's it, how's it going this early morning for you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I mean, it's not. It's nine a.m. This is God. Who? When I said let's do this in the morning, I didn't mean now. <laughs> <laughs> so this week, uh, there's a bunch of stories to talk about. Nothing like massive, but a bunch of really interesting uh, little stories to talk about. And we'll also get a chance to talk about CEO Pop uh, halfway through the show uh, with Ralph as well. So I want to uh, open by chatting about Facebook's new save function. So if you haven't noticed it yet, uh, on the little drop down menu that appears when you click on the top right hand of, of a shared link on Facebook, and uh, now there's a new save option. So so you can save uh, uh, the item into a new uh, tab essentially which appears on the uh, left hand side of your screen on the desktop version uh, or in the more tab on the app and uh, the interesting thing is that Facebook actually is categorizing automatically these entries uh, so if you're saving a, a you know a link that goes into the link section if you're saving a piece of music from Spotify say it goes into the music section and the same for books films TV shows and events uh, so it seems to be a really straightforward way to bring the f- functionality of apps like pocket or instapaper into uh, an app that's you know used by a billion plus people and and see how uh, they react to to using it so uh, what kind of impact do you think this will have on people's discovery habits on the music front uh, and uh, you know c- do you think it can have an impact also on the way facebook uh, targets users uh, as far as advertising is concerned uh, darren do you have any thoughts on that um, i think it it's it's potentially interesting i mean you know i do a lot of advertising on facebook um, and i think you are most definitely battling an issue where people um, don't at that instant that your ad is served want to engage with whatever it is you're trying to push and particularly when that's an off-site destination you know right. you're you're wrestling with, uh, with you know tearing them away from all the other stuff in the news feed to kind of uh, get them to, to show interest in what you're doing so I think it's certainly interesting um, I mean part of me kind of rolled my eyes at the fact that they've just you know <laughs> kind of squarely taken on the likes of Pocket and Instapaper. I'd imagine the people at Pocket are a little annoyed. Yeah, uh, and they're you know, and it's that kind of thing where they just seem to keep creeping out and you know, starting competitor services all over the place, which is normally Google's kind of uh, trick. But um, but no, from an advertising perspective, I think it's interesting. I think what will be the the, the uh, metric to keep an eye on, I guess, from a marketing point of view, is the degree to which people actually go back to that stuff and right. and engage with it. I mean, I think it's interesting because unlike Pocket, they're not they don't cache the articles. So, like on Pocket, if I save an article, it saves it into Pocket, and then if I'm on a plane, I can kind of pull it up and read it and 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 all of that. Um, Facebook, my you know, my understanding is it doesn't do that. It's literally saving a bookmark really yeah. um, uh, that, that you can then go I mean otherwise to, it, would yeah. have probably, it would have probably created some huge issues around people you know claiming with Facebook for rights on whatever content was saved yeah. <laughs> no exactly and you know it would inevitably start a punch up but you know justifiably I would think um, but so you know I think it would be interesting but I'm, I'm kind of curious it's the, 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 the bit I'm curious about is the degree to which people will actually return to it and you know, click to view the content compared to because even you know I get that with Pocket. I mean, I've been using Pocket for I, I don't know how long, six or seven years. You know, when it started as Read It Later, um, and there's a definite degree to which I'll save stuff 
and then you know I'll, I'll forget it's there or i'll yeah. go back and, mm-hmm. and then think i don't really know why i saved this or just mark it as red without even reading it and stuff like that so i suspect there may be a similar kind of thing here but it, yeah. it will be interesting to to see yeah i mean the amount of pdf that i saved to my evernote and i don't actually end up having the time to read but uh, uh ralph uh, <laughs> I can say that about evernote on the whole for me I, I still have a premium account i don't know why i never <laughs> use it <laughs> I, I save about so four, 500 megs of data a month on it so yeah i use it a lot uh, <laughs> i think what, what darren mentioned in, um as his last statement um that you forget about all the things you you stored you know uh, that probably might be um a big issue i mean for facebook you know right. i mean because they don't forget, you know, what you have saved and what links you saved and stuff. Um, on the first-hand side, it, personally, it looks like a great idea, of course, because your timeline is rushing like nothing else, you know, and um, especially during daytime when you're doing different things, you just have a short look on Facebook, okay, you just um, bookmark something. But as Darren said, at the end, it's, um, it's another tool for Facebook to target you and your habits and your likes and whatever. And, yeah, um, that's exactly the point. I mean, it's very clever, and um, of course, I was wondering why they didn't um, bring it on earlier, right? Yeah, so. yeah. And I mean, the, the other thing that's interesting is because Facebook is, is placing itself as in, in the position of being a platform rather than trying to provide services, uh, and their music strategy is, is very much being based on integrating other services uh, in, in different ways as part of uh, the Facebook experience. It would be interesting to see if they could create something like a playlist, BBC playlist or experience, where you know, you could save a bunch of music to that saved function, and then you may be able to export it into your streaming service of choice, for example, as a playlist. So that, that might be quite a cool uh, exactly. little feature for, for, for Facebook to have, although I, I don't really know how many people would use it, but mm. who knows? Be like Playlister. Not yeah. many. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's a nice idea in principle, but the adoption is... <laughs> kind of it's, pro- low. It's, prob- it's going to be probably more interesting for exploring new new stuff or stuff you don't listen to normally, right? Like yeah. some random video from a band from whatever, 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever. Yeah, so, I mean, that's my thinking is, is would it um, let people store stuff? I mean, in, in my experience, directly embedded content where you're pushing a new video from an artist, you're uh, significantly more likely to get engagement with it, but yeah. specifically because people don't have to leave their experience to enjoy exactly. the content. They can just hit play and watch it, which is also why Facebook's directly uploaded video gets infinitely more engagement than a YouTube video because it's True. bigger and it tells you how long it is. It's, it gives you all the little signals you need to, to get a feel of it, to engage with it. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I mean, go back to your point, Andrea, about the music service side. Of it. it feels a little bit niche. I mean, I'm yeah. still, you know, waving the flag for Facebook at some point, just buying a separate music service and then threading that all through this because it just feels more and more like Facebook is going to be more of the... Uh, you know, a sort of central aggregator point for mm-hmm. other things. And at the moment, it seems the emphasis is very much on news and what's going on on the web. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like a pumped-up version of what Dig was many, many moons ago. Um, but you can see that they're sort of pulling in this ecosystem around it of, of external apps. And I wonder if it's... It seems to me to be more, more logical that a music service would pop up within that, partly because at the moment, if you look at their acquisitions, it seems like there's something of a gap where a music service would kind of drop right in there. So it yeah. um, be interesting to see. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can yeah. just imagine the emails flying around from uh, managers at various corporations that do allow uh, allow employees to use Facebook, saying, pointing out uh, about uh, this little little neat function, saying, oh, you don't actually need to read this stuff while you're at work. You can actually save it for later. <laughs> <laughs> read it in your Good own time when you get home. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, so uh, next, uh, there's a few stories about Spotify this week. So. Uh, the, they are all like relatively small in themselves, but uh, they're quite intriguing. I, I want to actually open with uh, something that came up uh, last night, uh, as uh, Yahoo reports that uh, uh, Fortune Magazine's brainstorm tax, uh, sorry, that at uh, uh, Fortune Magazine's brainstorm tax conference in Aspen, Colorado, Spotify CEO Daniel Ek uh, stated that an IPO is not really a focus for the company. Uh, you know, he said the primary thing for us is just growing the business, and he added that I personally don't understand the quarterly capitalism of Wall straight and I don't think it's good so this is a very interesting public statement uh, uh, you know 
considering that the company has, has been rumored to be well on its way towards an IPO uh, this year. Uh, at the same time, the quarterly mentality of uh, Wall Street and, and that drives US businesses, as we've seen yesterday with the, the earning calls uh, of Microsoft and, and Apple, for example, it can really be a burden when you're a service like Spotify and you're still in a growth phase and investing a lot of money in international expansion and probably losing quite a bit of money as well in the process. So, uh, you know, Ralph, what, what do you make of this? And do you think that Spotify will still IPO this year? Or is this really like a, a Daniel Ek putting the brakes on the potential IPO and saying, wait a second, we, we might do it, but it may actually be next year, to be honest? Well, actually, this could be a deal breaker. I mean, I'm not a Wall Street guy, but uh, he's completely right because, I mean, the growing the growth strategy of Spotify um, is not about, um, I mean, the revenue is not parallel growing to the, um, to the user side, right? right. And um, I think this could be for an IPO, this is like, I mean, if you have, if you have to prove quarterly your growth figures or whatever, I don't know exactly how it works on Wall Street, you know, but uh, this could be like um, a real problem for them, as yeah. we can imagine. And also they, they have to uh, show that before the IPO, they would actually have to uh, disclose uh, a lot about the company, which is Absolutely. maybe something that they're not willing to do at this stage, depending on, on how the numbers are looking uh, at the moment. So, uh, but as you said, it's quite, it's quite interesting that he's pointing out that on a, on a very um, you know, public level, right? That it's uh, quite unusual. Yeah. Uh, Darren, what, what do you make of this, this statement? And, uh, you know, we've all been sort of uh, commenting on stories up to this point with the assumption that that's where the company was heading uh, towards the end of the year. We also, you know, talked about the uh, acquisition of the Equinest as a move towards, uh, you know, Spotify having a broader, uh, you know, solid uh, footprint in the space and, and being able to justify uh, the IPO. W what do you make of it? Um, I, I mean, I think it's an interesting one, really, in the sense that, you know, I mean, uh, I think, com I mean, I could be wrong, but I think it's, it, I, I work on the assumption that companies floating on stock exchanges or, you know, doing the IPO route need to be turning some kind of a profit along the way, one would hope, or at least thinning losses. And at the moment, I'm not sure Spotify is sort of doing that in a manner that would have investors massively running toward them. You know what I mean? Right. It, it, it's, it's not the most compelling case uh, compared to quite a lot of other tech companies out there and their, and their revenues particularly, you know. Um, so and, and equally, I, I you know, and uh, everything I hear about Daniel Ek kind of suggests that he is, you know, he's a, a, a genuine kind of music fan, and he's very invested into his business. And it's not just a kind of grow it, flip it, and you know, fuck off kind of mentality here, where yeah. he'll build a company, sell it, and move on super quick. I, I just, I don't quite see that, and I'm not entirely sure that you know the other shareholders would would see it that way either. You know, I think yeah. there's a more compelling story that Spotify still has yet to build. And if I was an investor personally, I would probably be thinking now is not the time to be doing <laughs> this. And, and the time is further down the line yeah. when they're showing a profitability there and they've really dominated the marketplace. Because at the minute, you know, they're kind of dominant in a sense, but in, in, in the grand scheme, you know, there's... Uh, every likelihood that something else could come along and still whip the rug out from under them. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, they're, 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 they're kind of dominant, but they're, they're sort of like the biggest minnow in the pond at the moment, you know, <laughs> but it wouldn't take long for something much, much bigger to, to potentially upset that. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's it's two different approaches. Of course, uh, we've seen Pandora. Uh, they've been public for a number of years, and they, of course, have struggled through that, and are still not uh, entirely profitable. And but they've managed to, you know, the, the stock price has managed to uh, rise. Uh, uh, you know, of course, in between different uh, uh, downturns, but you know, overall, the stock price is, is doing well. And uh, and so, you know, it's just a case of essentially understanding what the best strategy for the company is. It may even be that uh, Spotify uh, doesn't want to float on the uh, Nasdaq on the on or on the New York Stock Exchange, that they might want to choose a different uh, place to float, given that it's a mm. European company as well. So yeah, mm. well, it's definitely an interesting uh, story to keep an eye on. And uh, there were actually uh, some uh, reports yesterday that were uh, immediately uh, uh, negated by Recode. And uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal reported that apparently Google, uh, at, at one point, uh, had uh, uh, made a bid uh, or was in active negotiations to acquire uh, Spotify uh, for in the region of four or five billion, I think, uh, as far as the article reported. But uh, Recode actually uh, said that they 
done their own investigation and this was actually not true. So uh, interesting here, a standoff between two uh, big publications that are usually uh, pretty well respected. But uh, mm -hmm. it seems like the Wall Street Journal was wrong in this case, uh, apparently. And uh, uh, the other thing uh, was uh, talking about Spotify's uh, Asian expansion. So there was an interesting article by uh, Kaylin Hong from the Next Web, uh, uh, an interview with the head of Asia at Spotify, Sunita Kaur. So in the article, uh, Kaur said that the company is eyeing up a lot more markets in Asia for the next 12 to 18 months and is aware of the need to do more partnerships with hardware and media, hardware and media companies and also uh, you know it needs to organize uh, more events to raise awareness of the brand uh, around the different territories so and this is an interesting point that she makes is the fact that in Europe and in the US uh, uh, Spotify's uh, uh, growth was really uh, driven for the most part by its users the company hasn't done a lot of uh, you know uh, front page advertising or you know any sort of advertising really apart from uh, a few campaigns here and there and uh, you know she brings up the fact that in Asia uh, Spotify has got much less awareness and so it may actually need to work a lot more on its branding in order to get into uh, uh, more people's hands so uh, interesting here to see the different uh, approach that Spotify might have to take in, in, in the Asian territories uh, you know do you see for example, uh, you know, Japan is, uh, of course, one of the territories that everybody's waiting for uh, uh, Spotify to launch in. Uh, can you see, can you see uh, the company being able to sort of flip from this model where it's uh, driven by users to a model where it has to really uh, become front and center and uh, have an, an advertising strategy and have a growth strategy that doesn't rely on, on word of mouth quite so much, uh, Darren? I mean, I think at some point they are going to have to <clears throat> you know, do the hard work as well. Yeah, you know, I think really in 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 real terms at the moment, Spotify has been surprisingly thrifty when it comes to their uh, their marketing spends. You know, yeah. when you look at what brands normally throw at, at their marketing, you know, Spotify, as I would imagine, is a drop in the ocean, and everything about their strategies has sort of screamed that it's it's very much. I mean, not so much user led, but I think they're certainly you know they're backing you know promotion via artists and things like that, and they're letting brands get involved, and then the brands are doing the legwork to carry the Spotify brand with it, you know, so Coca-Cola is maybe a good case in point. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, I mean, I think at some point they are going to have to do it. And it's interesting, right, because, you know, if the argument is that when they get to Asia, they're going to uh, have to spend a lot of money on marketing, then that means, you know, their losses may... may Be kind uh, of bigger, over, yeah. Yeah, they, you know, over a year or two while they're making this kind of aggressive expansion, you know, their losses will, will, uh, will really, uh, you know, hike. So I think it's, um, it's interesting, you know, it kind of dovetails across back to this IPO discussion. You know, maybe they're, they want to get all that kind of thing out of the way first so that when they go for an IPO, they're, you know, very much just established and all they've got to do now is, is sort of push and, and grow that bit more but they've got their feet on the ground in all the territories they need to be in and everything else but yeah, yeah. i think you know asia is sort of long since proved a really tricky one to crack for for most companies you know there isn't a streaming service it sounds like the whole streaming market in japan particularly is not particular. you know it's not it's not uh, not really established on any level yet no, so it'll be uh, it'll be very interesting to see certainly yeah, and then, you know, it could it could act as this, you know, savior of industry in Japan, you know, considering that uh, it, the, the industry is taking a turn for the worst over there, uh, considering that uh, CD sales are, are dropping pretty heavily and there isn't a substitute uh, for CD sales. Downloads haven't really mm. taken off as much. Uh, uh, of course, the sales of ringtones have, have plummeted uh, and, uh, you know, streaming could really wedge in there as, as being something that can lift the Japanese music industry. But, of course, it needs to be something that uh, consumers are willing to uh, take on board and, and, and try out so we'll see what happens on, on that front i mean i think i think it may be something where it will <clears throat> you know it may just jump a generation i mean it's a bit like the uh the internet access discussion around africa you know where they've they've sort of bypassed the entire wired infrastructure that we've all grown up around mm -hmm. in in europe you know and they're just sort of jumping straight to a wireless yeah. uh internet because it's just easier to roll out wireless internet now than it is to roll out wired and i think it's you know it's a similar thing in, in, in the Far East where you're talking about the streaming services, you know, downloads, I don't think have, have ever really cottoned on to quite the same extent. And so it may simply be that they'll just jump straight from physical to streaming and, yeah. and that entire sort of era of, of the download model just won't ever really have gained traction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ralph, right. uh, what, what, anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, we have to face reality. There is not an Asian market, right? We have so many different Asian markets. I mean, 
Singapore is totally different from China and uh, Hong Kong is not China, like New York is not the US and uh, Japan is different to Vietnam, etc., etc. Um, I think, I mean, the, the Spotify model, like, to get a conversion rate of approximately 20% at this point, I mean, therefore you need um, strong partners, right? But when it comes to China, um, it's a monopoly market in any in any ways, right? And um, if you have to find a deal with, let's say, China Mobile, which is the world largest mobile provider, in the, the world largest player, they have like I think 750 million clients um, uh, or customers, um, and two others are just I mean, 300 million more, right? So you have to find um, negotiations with them, and it's so hard to find deals with these people, you know. And, we tried to make business once with like China Mobile for uh, download stuff. Um, that was a nightmare, you know. Yeah. It's um, it's it's actually not possible, you know. And, so um, yeah. I, I, at this point, let's say speaking about China, I don't see any chance for Spotify to enter that market, you know, because you have like um, already you, know, you don't have you don't have Facebook, you don't have Twitter, you don't have Google Plus, and you don't even have. Um, um, we have all different services, you know, there's WeChat, you know, which is like, um, uh, you have like, uh, what's it called, um, Weibo and stuff, you know, like yeah. huge, huge, huge companies and only used in that territory. So Spotify had to find a strategy to work together with these services in the first time. And of course, let's not, let's not forget that uh, in Europe and to, to some extent in the US as well, a lot of carriers have been burnt by trying to create their own services uh, when it comes to music over the years, which have all for, uh, in some to some extent, failed. And so that's... I think why also we're seeing more partnerships being formed between third-party mm -hmm. music services and carriers. So whilst uh, in the markets like China, I, I don't think that the carriers have yet had that experience of trying to build uh, a content uh, service and failing at it and, and then turning to a third party to provide that. So they might still think, you know, we have the scale, we have, you know, 500 million users. Why should we give that business to somebody else if we can create it internally? But on the other hand, you have like, there's an analysis of mobile users in China. They are all really, really close to brands, you know. Right. They, they follow more likely brands than following artists, you know, which is a weird Chinese um, uh, thing, you know. So that might be a door opener on that side, you know. But as long as it comes to find negotiations with the services and the carriers, it's going to be a huge problem. Yeah. Uh, if I would be Spotify, I would follow the markets which have a sustainable music industry, let's say, so uh, in Asia, which means Singapore, on the one hand, because there's a lot of money, and probably Korea, yeah. because they have like a huge um, uh, scene working on its own, like the K-pop stuff and all the um, um, yeah, um, the relationship between brands, uh, stores, uh, shopping, music, and all that stuff. That could be uh, also quite interesting for them. Yeah, Japan. I cannot really speak for Japan, but China, I don't see. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Ralph, actually, I wanted to stick with you for a second and ask you a little bit about what's happening with the CEO Pop, uh, which is uh, uh, going to take. Uh, it's, it's taking place uh, in the second half of August in uh, Cologne. So, a festival and a convention. Can you tell us a little bit about, about uh, uh, how the, the 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 event is organized and uh, what you're planning for for the convention this year? Okay, so the CEO Pop convention is parallel to uh, the CEO Pop festival, which happens now in the 12th year in yes. Cologne, Germany. In Cologne, Germany. Uh, we, we established CEO Pop once back when Popcom, some of the people out there know it still, um, went to Berlin and then died, more or less. Um, it's not existing anymore. So CEO Pop was a, like a bottom-up event for the right. uh, German independent music scene, um, already focusing on on digital issues from the very first uh, moment. So that was always part of the conference. And, um, and this year, the two-day conference is focusing on one day is about branded entertainment, the music brands and branded content. And the second day about content distribution in general. And it's funny to speak about Spotify because we're going to have the German general manager, Stefan Zilch, speaking about Spotify and the new strategy about creating moments, which is like a, um, an interesting um, issue how to to measure the playlists of people and the habits and how to um, monetize that with brands and corporations. That's, that's going to be his talk about this. And, uh, so, yeah, we're going to have a lot of people from the brands, brand industries, um, and the music industry uh, joining together. Broad range, 
from, let's say, Jägermeister to Red Bull, Telecom, um, Spotify, uh, independent labels, distribution companies. Um, yeah. Awesome. That's great. And, and of course, if people want to know more about the festival, they can head to c-o-pop.de for more information and to check out the program, which is great. And I look forward to recording a few uh, great interviews uh, during the festival as well. Yeah. So, uh, and Darren, from your end, I want to do this uh, now so that it's, it's sort of a little, a little bit better place than uh, at the end of the show anything that she, you uh, want to chat about of course I'm not gonna uh, ask you uh, uh, what LJ plans are for the album release because I'm sure those are strictly confidential but uh, uh, as far as anything else that's going on that you want to push anything that you want to you want to tell us uh, there's always too many to mention you know we've got got the Women's Hour album out this week that's a really good Absolutely, record yeah, on Secretly great. Canadian very 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 good record um, so uh, that's cool. They're playing at Rough Trade tonight, so I'm going to head down there and uh, see what that's about. Um, beyond that, there's just too many other things going on to mention, really. Uh, weirdly, um, here's a slightly off-topic off one. I got given a Nokia 1020 phone uh, by Microsoft. Um, right. uh, they're sponsoring one of the AIM Awards, and, uh, and uh, so they've, they've given me this, this handset, and uh, it's that one with a 42-megapixel camera. Right. Have you seen this? So it's kind of got this, like, it's, and it's amazing. I'm having Is so much amazing? fun playing with it. Right. It's bananas, yeah. I mean, it, it basically, it just allows you to take these 42 megapixel pictures, which you can then kind of, it sort of negates the need to zoom on anything, because you just capture, like, a massive picture at super high res, and then if you want to crop it down to kind Done. of that, that thing, you're still left with, like, an 8 megapixel shot that you'd probably get from a standard Wow. camera elsewhere but it's really good and i love it because it's i mean as i said this is so not the <laughs> not music related but it's the, so here's the thing right so you got the camera and yeah. then it comes as well or you can get rather a kind of holster that you put it in that gives it a slightly beefier thing and a bit of an, and an extra battery so it will last even longer it kind of makes it feel more like a camera yeah but then the whole thing is kind of woven into uh i think it's called OneDrive, which is like their equivalent of google drive and it's really cool because if you take a picture and you've got it set to, to the I don't care about my bandwidth setting, it will kind of automatically back up even the 42 megapixel shots yeah. into the cloud. Now, I'm going on holiday next week and I now fully intend to take the camera with me <laughs> because it's really good. There's Wi-Fi wherever I am. And so it kind yeah. of means wherever I am, I can just take pictures, knowing safe in the knowledge that it will immediately back it up to the cloud. And then if someone kind of swipe my well, Microsoft's phone, I should say. It's not mine. Uh, you know, and it, it, would, it, it wouldn't be an issue. But, but, uh, but know, careful, using something, it's careful kind of, about it's, those roaming charges if, you, if the Wi-Fi ends up going off and then you end up uploading a 42 uh, megapixel uh, picture yeah, no, on your I'm, 3G plan. <laughs> I'm boxing clever by not putting a SIM in it. So right. there is no mobile data. <laughs> I'm keeping my phone over here. I can't remember. But it's kind of, it's just, you know, it's uh, you have this with Google phones now and again where they do something and it suddenly makes you realise that someone's really pushed the barrier like a yeah. lot further forward and with this phone because it's got a whole pro setting where you can pick the isos and everything else it's like a proper you know it's kind of got not quite the functions of an slr but yeah i have to say i'm really impressed as someone who probably would have rolled his eyes and walked away if someone was like buy a nokia phone no, 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 <laughs> i have to say like I, I don't think i would have ever bet on you uh, doing essentially a free commercial for microsoft and nokia <laughs> i know it's weird right it's kind of strange but, that's amazing i mean you know like i said full disclosure they did give it to me but it was kind of like <laughs> Yeah, I have to say. I mean, I you know. But with no strings focus. attached. So if, if you if you if you thought it was crap, you would have told us. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, More I did work on a policy where, like, if well, if I think something's crap, then I just don't mention it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, which is telling on my you know, if you see me on Facebook raving about a band I'm working with, it's because I genuinely like them. Yeah, yeah. And then if if you just don't see me mentioning bands, then it's you know, then perhaps I'm less keen. Yes. Um, exactly. But exactly. it's the same with this. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite bizarre. It's sort of like a really good camera just happens to be a phone as well nice. so uh, so yeah i thought mm. i'd mention that in aside i'm not trying to push a, a microsoft infomercial <laughs> on you so i apologize if it seems that way but it was more because you know like you i'm a little no, dismissive of these things and when you use it and you're like huh oh, this is what do you know cool, yeah. it doesn't suck it's actually really good um, <laughs> quite quite the shock 
So, awesome. Fair play to them. And uh, uh, the next story I want to talk about was uh, uh, is the case of Ultra versus uh, Michelle Fan. So I got quite into this case and I was looking uh, at all the different articles and reactions. And so I'll try and lay it out for the listeners that may not be aware of what's going on. So essentially, um, the dance music label is suing uh, the YouTube celebrity Michelle Fan for copyright infringement over the songs that she uses as a background to her videos. So uh, a lot of those songs are ultra music songs and uh, especially they are cascade tracks. So the label claims to have already identified dozens of infringements and uh, the case was filed in the US District Court, uh, District Court, Court of Los Angeles and could prove really to be a milestone case for uh, YouTube and for uh, video producers that are uploading videos to YouTube. Essentially, uh, you know, the record label and the, uh, the publishing house uh, contends that fan profited from the use of the artist's tracks uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, she had been uh, told that these tracks, of course, were a property of the label, but she didn't take down the videos. And she even responded to a DMCA-style takedown uh, by uh, doing, you know, essentially a, a counter uh, a takedown to get uh, keep her videos online. So uh, this all kind of comes down to the way that uh, YouTube sets up uh, certain channels uh, and that's uh, I think something that's going to come under scrutiny because uh, apparently uh, and that's something that uh, I've uh, looked into but I wasn't able to verify entirely Michelle Fan's channel appears to be managed uh, through an MCN for monetization uh, and uh, it's classed as a managed channel which means that uh, she is essentially able to bypass content ID uh, because she uh, is supposed to make sure that all the content that goes through her channel is already uh, uh, Appropriate, appropriately licensed and, and doesn't require any further licenses to be uh, to be made public. So uh, in that sense, if that was true, uh, the claim by Ultra actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, of course, whether it's worth $150,000 per infringement, that's a whole other uh, story. Uh, but if Ultra was to win, it, really, it would really shine a spotlight on on how these mana channels work and uh, uh, how labels can essentially try and find a way to uh, uh, get money out of them if they're not uh, properly paying for, for the music that's being used. Uh, uh, Cascade uh, himself actually is completely against the lawsuit. He said that, uh, you know, he um, he actually tweeted uh, Michelle Fan saying, you're awesome, you've turned millions of people onto my music, uh, uh, which ironically I, can't, I cannot say for my label. So he seems to be uh, pretty against uh, the, the lawsuit, although of course, the label owns the rights to the track so there's not much you can do on that and uh, you know I, I'm really interested in seeing how this plans out because uh, you know I think there is uh, there is a potential here to see the case uh, go for ultra if the conditions that I talked about earlier uh, are, are essentially true uh, and, and that could actually have repercussions at large on, on the YouTube ecosystem I think. Uh, but Darren what are your thoughts on, on this story and and uh, uh, this claim it's 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 a very interesting one i think for us yeah it's it's fascinating isn't it i mean i think it's um it's it's i mean it it seems to me to be reasonably cut and dried i mean you know as you said if uh this channel is a managed one such that she is responsible for the content that goes onto it and bypasses content id and she does not have any kind of proof that ultra have consented to this then she is almost certainly going to lose the case there's a sort of delicious irony, I suppose, to uh, Cascade standing up to voice support because obviously quite recently, you know, he's fairly vocally anti-copyright, which really doesn't make him the guy that you want fighting your corner on this. <laughs> because if anything, he's, he's yeah. kind of handing the stick to Ultra Records to beat Michelle Fan with because his voicing support is, is probably not going to help her case at all. Yeah. And at the end of the day, with this kind of thing, where you have copyright ownership, pure and simple, it's that cut and dried, that unless she can demonstrate that she has clear consent, then she will be in breach. And if she, you know, if there is proof that DMCA takedowns have been issued, and then have been kind of countered and ignored, or that she leveraged the system to get around that, then it, you know, it all, it doesn't pan out too well for her. So I think, as a case, it doesn't strike me as one that's going to be particularly... Oh, I'm being heckled by my cat. No. <laughs> um, it doesn't strike me as one that's going to be particularly uh, controversial. You know what I mean? It's not... I, if, I mean, it's not, I it's not sit, controversial, it, it seems... but at the same time, it, sh it really, like, uh, indicates a, a, a real problem uh, in the way that the, the videos, are, you know, the upload process for videos yeah, of yeah, mana channels so. are... And, it's, is and, and the, the thing I found most kind of... Uh, interesting around this relative to the 
the broader picture of this is, you know, this is happening at a time when, on the one hand, you know, YouTube is locked in a rather ugly battle with independent rights holders around the contracts for the premium music service, yeah. whilst at the same time announcing a day or two ago that they're going to invest further into, uh, you know, emergent content creators on their platform, like Michelle Fan. Yeah. So they kind of, I mean, aside from the fact there's a, a whole other discussion about the degree to which they're just... Uh, pulling the rug out from under MCNs, which one could argue here, um, you know, it, it, it certainly puts this interesting position forward where YouTube have come forward saying they're going to back these people to create this content, and there you have a success story from that specific kind of, you know, strategy where she's built a channel and built a personality, a, you know, a brand on there and is now being found liable of trampling all over copyright, which independent rights holders would say YouTube have been trying to do with all of their content as well. So right. um, it doesn't paint a particularly great picture. And I think, for me, the question is, is I, th I think Michelle Fan is going to lose this case, unless we're, we're all missing something very substantial around this, yeah. you know, like the, the smoking gun kind unless of Unless there's like a trail of emails with Ultra that where they yeah, say, oh, okay, know, yeah, go for it or something. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You know, and, unless that's the case, she's going to lose. But then the question is whether Ultra decides to really go to town and broaden this to pick a fight with, with YouTube as well. And if that's the case, well, then that's when it will, it will really get interesting. Yeah. And, and Ralph, uh, of course, in Germany, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a long time sore point to YouTube, uh, uh, you know, considering all the controversy around it, uh, the game negotiations, uh, never ending game negotiations, the fact that a lot of labels are getting around uh, uh, the YouTube block by actually categorizing music into, into, you know, music videos into different categories so that it actually bypasses the, the, the bands. So w what is your take on this case and, and how, how do you see this shaping up for YouTube? Well, I mean, you know that at this at this point we have um, uh, very hard discussions between the VUT, the Independent Association, and YouTube um, regarding the up and coming streaming uh, idea of YouTube. Yeah. And um, the whole debate to have a fair digital deal, um, you know, between all the shareholders and um, what Impala is trying to um, to do with uh, with YouTube as well. That's a tough thing, actually, right? Because I mean, as we know, the Indies um, have a, a a share of 30% of the market, and if you are not Sony, not Universal, it's really hard to speak with one voice and to make a deal with you At this point, this is the main debate in Germany, so we're going to yeah. have that. I mean, they will have a close look on stuff like that as well, of course, you know, um, as soon as it's, it's touching the copyright uh, things, and in this case, it's the, the publisher who is just uh, suing uh, YouTube and not the artist, of course. Yeah. Um, it's going to be quite interesting what impact this is going to have on, on the European market as well, which is different to the US, of course, but um, uh, I, I would say this at this very particular moment, we have um, a very, very... Um, close eye on that actually yeah that. and i think like actually gamer might feel uh, vindicated in a sense be given all that's happened in the last uh, couple of months because of its hard stance with Absolutely. youtube that in a sense you know they were really criticized also from musicians and labels in germany uh, because of the inability for them to monetize uh, the, the content but in, in this sense you know the fact that youtube has come out with this uh, uh, you know unfair deals and everything else for the independent sector maybe gamer now can actually say well we were right from the start Let's hope so. I mean, just, I mean, as you know, we have like, at this, during CO Pop, we're going to have a new collecting society. Um, yeah, C3S. Going, um, going around C3S, and um, it might bring some, you know, movement into the, uh, into a very conservative um, structure in a way, you know, that people are depending on the gamer deals, you know. So I cannot see where it goes to, but um, it took C3S a long way to go there, but they uh, managed to do it I mean, after two years. Um, so let's see. I mean, maybe uh, it helps out, especially the Indies. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, going from uh, YouTube to talking about hardware, actually, I wanted to uh, quickly have a, a brief discussion about uh, uh, the new Samsung headphones. So, of course, uh, you know, while Apple decided to buy Beats for uh, 3 billion, Samsung decided to bring out its own version of the high-end headphones. Uh, and to be fair, you know, Samsung did announce them uh, back in uh, March or no, April, actually, was, uh, you know, so that was way before the first rumors of the hookup between Apple and Beats uh, started to circulate. Uh, so there is actually no direct correlation there, but uh, uh, Samsung has announced uh, that its uh, new high-end headphones uh, line is going to, uh, to go on sale in the United States. Uh, there are four model 
levels, starting with a uh, level over headphone, which will cost uh, 350 bucks uh, and will feature Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth connectivity, NFC, active noise cancellation, and hopefully also great sound. Uh, and then there are less expensive options like the level on headphones, which are 179.99, uh, which uh, don't include the, uh, you know, the uh, functionality of the level over but are quite similar as uh, they just don't have the Wi-Fi wi uh, wireless and NFC functions and then there's the earbuds uh, which are the level in which cost 149.99 so pretty expensive earbuds really considering and finally there's another Bluetooth speaker which is really quite similar to all other Bluetooth speakers out there uh, which is called the level box uh, so uh, in this sense uh, is it just a uh, you know is in another case of uh, uh, me too and uh, uh, can Samsung in any way compete with uh, Beats uh, incredibly cunning marketing machine which has made their headphones really the, the, the headphones of choice for athletes and musicians uh, uh, all, all over the world that really want to show that they're wearing the brand and that's something they have chosen for uh, for a reason. Uh, uh, Ralph, any, any thoughts on that? Oh, a lot of thoughts. <laughs> actually, um, the whole thing with Beats actually for me is, I mean, you hear a lot, you hear a lot about complaints that the, the technically a Beats headphone is not state of the art, right? right? It's just a, it's a, it's a fashionable wearable. Everybody, you mentioned it. It's like in sports and especially during the World Cup, when uh, the the players were forbidden to wear it uh, when the official FIFA cameras out, were on, and just that brought even more attention um, yeah. to the web and, and social media and stuff. So. Um, it's not about a streaming service. We know that it's about it's about something else. It's about like um, another hardware gadget you need to bring to the market. And um, I, I'm not sure if you should compete with Beats at this point because it's like a, they are so ahead in the market when it comes to um, to peer groups and everything. Um, there might be a small niche maybe for high end headphones when you combine it with let's say a streaming service like Wim, for instance. Yeah. which uh, also uses the niche of having um, super good files instead of like the crappy uh, other files of streaming services in a way. So if you want to have good good music, you know, you need good headphones. That might be like a combination which can work out, but that's not a mass market in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Darren, what, what do you reckon? If you take, if you take a, a headphone that is similar to the Beats headphone at a similar price point, but you take away the branding association and, and all that comes with it, what are you left with and, and can Samsung work with that? Um, well, you, you're not left with much, let's be frank. I mean, <laughs> it's, but I don't think that's necessarily the, the point at which they're looking to compete. I mean, I, I you know, Beats are very much, rightly or wrongly, I mean, you know, I I um, I know the guy that kind of runs the uh, like the the DJ division of the, the Beats headphones sort of line, the pro line, and and by all accounts, the pro line of Beats headphones, where they actually uh, focus on the the quality, is a, a, you know a very very good and also incredibly expensive. Um, but generally, you know, Beats has made its name on fashion headphones first and foremost, which is why a lot of people like to jab the you know they their, their style over substance um but i think when you look at samsung generally and its approach across the board it's been pretty good at, at trying to bring a degree of style but also coupling it with a lot more substance you yeah. know when you look at how they took on the iphone in the handset market you know they 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 just dialed it all up a bit on the on the, the sort of functionality front and things like that and I don't know, you know, I think with with the headphones, if they can bring things in that have the style, but also bring a bit more to this, you know, like the active noise cancellation, for example, you know, stuff like that, but then bring the price lower so that they can chip into the Beats market, because, you know, that's how they made stole a march with their handsets. You know, they were, you know, significantly cheaper than an iPhone at the beginning. I mean, I think probably a bit less so now. Um, you know, but that's what made them a compelling proposition because they seem to have all the functions of an iPhone but without the price tag. Now, yeah. if the same sort of theory is applied with headphones where you're saying well, it's got all of this but w with, without the cost, then they might well steal a much because really when you look at, you know, like when Google had the Nexus handsets uh, and tablets and when Motorola had, you know, their handsets admittedly under Google's kind of ownership, no, but, but the whole thing there was very much let's present a device that is maybe not quite as good as an iPhone, yeah. but which is like, you know, 200 pounds off contract. So it's like, you know, a third or, or, or more of the price. 
um, then it becomes a really compelling proposition. And at the end of the day, you know, people are still a bit led by their wallet. You know, I think there is a fashion element to it and kids want beats because that's the current thing. But, you know, uh, peel back two, three years and people would have scoffed at the notion of Samsung challenging an iPhone market. Yeah, and I think they've sure. done an incredibly good job of that. Yeah. They've done it so well that now they're challenging the Android market by threatening to, to sort of, you know, launch their own OS and all sorts of other things in the shape of this Tizen platform, whatever it is. So I, I wouldn't rule it out, you know, and they've got a lot of money to chuck at this, like yeah. a lot of money, you know. So, um, yeah, you know, based on their previous kind of experiences, I think their strategy will be, you know, bring it in, undercut the price on beats, dial it up on the function so maybe it does a little bit more on whatever level. And then I, I suspect... You might well see a, a you know competition there because they can certainly afford to sponsor the right people to wear these True. And, and that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, these days when you walk into like a big electronic store, you see your Monster display, you see your Beats display, and you see your Sennheiser display. Perhaps when it comes to uh, sort of uh, more expensive headphones, mm. and uh, uh, it seems like there's definitely still space for expansion in that in that area, and uh, everybody's sort of competing on the same function. Yeah, I mean, it, it, on a, a similar price point as well. Yeah, it feels to me that there's a lot of kind of Me Too's ran into this. You know, we've definitely had that whole thing where HMV in the UK was just, you know, festooned with fairly crappy designer, you know, fashion headphones. You yeah. know, and everyone's just run in to stick a branded product on there. But none of them were, were, were trying to appeal on anything other than, you know, the looks, really. Um, so I think having someone that's going to take it a bit more seriously and deliver more quality and, and you know and i wouldn't put it past samsung to really gun for beats on that front you know and try to make it personal you know it'd yeah. be interesting to see but again the, this will cost them shitloads of money right yeah. because i mean <laughs> i live around just around the corner here is saturn which is like the biggest mega store here in germany right and um i mean beats is dominating the headphone sections in any kind you know and every other competitor even they do like extra promotion outside and everything nobody cares you know just even it's low price headphones. People don't care. It's just like I mean, it's yeah. so focused on that fashionable thing of beats, right? And so um, it's well. true, but you know, they they bought Jay Z, so sure, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, no, no, that's, I mean, that's what you would, need. I mean, it's, it's the right people. And you think what well, they with their handsets, the you know, during the World Cup, you know, they had Ronaldo, yeah. they had Rooney, you know, they had all the A list players, so they can put a lot of money on it. If they, they really will. want to go, and they will, they will. <laughs> yeah, and uh, no, and uh, you know, it's an interesting space headphones, and I'm definitely quite interested to see what's going to happen next. And well, I've seen some interesting uh, advanced uh, functionality headphones that have like uh, touch screens on the side and all sorts of stuff happening uh, that are hackable and have APIs. And so I'm really interested to see what what how. I love the, the notion of a touch screen on the side of your headphones. Well, it's sort of like a it's like a touch sensitive <laughs> screen, so it's uh, like. Pad, so you can do different things depending on how you move your hand. Uh, so interesting things happening, really, and uh, and uh, I'd love to see if, if those reports of uh, Apple being building uh, sensors into headphones to be able to to give you uh, biometric data is also uh, uh, going to come yeah, true because be that could be quite cool. Uh, but I wanted to uh, go from headphones to uh, back to data as uh, uh, the music startup Sensari has released its web-based uh, graph analytics engine uh, dubbed the Music Graph AI. So uh, digital music trends listeners uh, will be familiar with Sanzari as uh, they sponsored the show back in March and uh, GigaOM uh, writes that the new engine is essentially a dashboard and backend system that users can access to that get detailed reporting on their accounts with the music graph which is a database that the company claims contains over a billion pieces of music data including song lyrics and the songwriters behind the year's top hits. Uh, so uh, you know the, the website touts allowing data scientists to execute uh, complex graph analytics and machine learning algorithm at the scale without the need to write a single line of code or software setup. So uh, Sanzari has, has done a lot of work uh, in, in the uh, sort of machine learning side of things uh, for its uh, uh, music graph uh, uh, system and uh, Definitely at, at a good time because uh, we all know that uh, with the Equinest acquisition, uh, there is less scope for companies using the Equinest uh, as their th solution, especially if there are competitors to uh, Spotify. Uh, Ralph, uh, have you seen a, uh, how? What is the program like around the data and discovery at uh, CEO Pop? And uh, have you seen an increase in, in their interest in this area since the Equinest acquisition? H how is that setting up in, in Germany? I think it's the big issue anyway, the data issue, right? Um, as I mentioned before, with the Spotify um, in Germany, what they are now working on, or just 
probably globally is um, if you can if you can find out what is the special moment someone wants to listen to a certain kind of music, then you are on the winning side, right? And um, to get that data, however you can get it, maybe to sensors or whatever. Um, there is new measuring systems. Uh, I was at a conference last week in Berlin at Tech Open Air where um, um, people from the Fraunhofer Institute, they just like measuring uh, brain data. Um, there is new touch, whatever. It's just like everything is already there, you know, just like it's just a question of um, how to combine it with existing um, databases. And yeah. so this is going to be, it will be the major issue in the next couple of years, I think. Um, yeah. And uh, I just bumped into this Zanari, Zanzari thing. Uh, I haven't heard before that. Um, so, yeah, I mean. And actually, uh, the, a lot of their uh, machine learning stuff was uh, created by, I think the name is Hans Christopher Booz or mm -hmm. something along those lines, who is the CEO of Arago, which is actually a company based uh, in Germany, I believe, uh, that yeah. does a lot of work uh, on data. So, uh, Absolutely. yeah, it's, it's a very interesting uh, tie up. And he was very keen on highlighting when I interviewed him back in, in, May, in March uh, that uh, he sort of wants to get rid of the assumptions that a lot of uh, recommendation services make around the music when they deliver the recommendations and he wanted to get back to more pure sort of a machine learning based uh, uh, delivery of, of that recommendation data. Uh, Darren, the, the, you know, uh, last, uh, was it two or three weeks ago, uh, uh, Duncan, uh, Duncan Gear uh, was mentioning that he believes that it's going to take a while for any company to catch up to the Econess because they've done so much work in the space. Uh, uh, how do you feel about that? Do you agree with him? And, and, uh, and uh, what, what kind of a chance these new entrants in the space ha have uh, to, to compete with uh, uh, the Econess's uh, offering? Um, I think they've got <clears throat> a chance, but it requires the buy-in of a sort of significant number of you know, services to provide the data, because at the end of the day, um, you know, it's the data that feeds that that uh, insight, and so right. they need that kind of buy-in. I mean, uh, from what I read of Sanzari, uh, you know, this proposition was a very much of a B two B one, yeah, um, which I found a bit curious, really. I think, that, I mean, B two B propositions like this, I just kind of read that and, and thought, well, that feels like you're then aiming at an extremely narrow market because how many? Surely, only music serves it. Well, there's maybe an argument that you could say that brands would want to know this kind of thing, that it might inform decisions around music supervision, for yeah. example. Yeah. So there's a possibility there. Um, but music services themselves, and particularly when you rule out Spotify as, as a, the, the sort of dominant streaming platform, yeah, it, it just it, it felt like, it, you know, there, there's very f sort of few people that they could be talking to, Yeah. really, you know. Um, so I, I found that side of it a, a bit curious um and it, i mean it will be interesting to see i mean i think you know I, I i do agree with duncan it'll take a while for people to build up that kind of insight uh, that the echo nest has um but it's not impossible and it will just take the right effort and i think there's a need for it now that the echo nest is sort of off the market if you like because yeah. they're spotify's um i mean the, the so other thing, the other thing to, to see. yeah the other thing to say is that of course uh no, if they have built a uh, comprehensive uh, platform around machine learning and content uh, and uh, databases, you know, this could be potentially replicable in, in other fields. So it may yeah. well be that music is sort of a starting point to, to uh, get some traction and, you know, uh, test the waters and understand how everything works. And then you could potentially extend this to different areas like movies or books or anything like that. So uh, definitely worth keeping an eye on something that is so data driven as opposed to other discover companies that are more focused certainly, on curation because they are limited to that vertical. It's a big leap of faith, isn't it? I mean, it, it, you yeah. know, with all of this, it feels the, the, the starting point for all of these discussions is, is a sort of assumption that big data has value yeah. and that what it delivers back is absolutely the correct insight. And I think that's still a reasonably well debated topic. You know, I think there's, I've certainly read a few articles that seem to suggest that we haven't really gained a great deal from this sort of epic quantity of data that's being collected generally around the world. You know, it's not provided the grand insight that perhaps people thought it would. Yeah. So I think that it's, it's certainly, you know, you have to step back a little and look at this and sort of say, well, 
fine. So this is a machine learning service, uh, you know, for or it's based upon machine learning for insight. Uh, but does that mean that the insight it turns out is uh, valuable and correct? Well, yeah. obviously, Sensari would would say yes, and doubtless they've you know they've they've got significantly more insight and expertise on this area than me. Um, but you know, I think it, it, we're still not there, are we? Even Echo Nest is. You know, it, it talks a great talk, but it's it's not the kind of be all and end all of recommendation systems, and I'm not yeah. sure that one may ever really exist because there's such a kind of illogical, non sequential, nebulous, random way in which humans connect with and interact with music generally that you know formulating it around any platform that tries to connect dots to draw conclusions is is to fundamentally misunderstand that. We don't we don't work like that. You don't go from A to B to C. You're just all over the damn place, you know. And trying to replicate that model is is uh, extremely hard. You know, the Echonest have done a reasonable job, um, but I don't think they've done a definitive job. And it's no, you know, the question sure. is whether Sensari could do the same or, or match it or beat it. I don't know. And I mean, it's also it's, a question of whether any company really wants want the definitive job. I mean, I think uh, any company that works in this space has to acknowledge that there, there's going to have to be a uh, sort of a balancing of uh, human curation and uh, and uh, computer generated uh, uh, data. So I mean, uh, I would imagine even Senzari, you know, I don't know if they would propose their service as the be all and end all solution for a music service, or you know, or if they would actually recommend to to mix it up with uh, some playlisting mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So definitely something that it would be interesting to discuss with them. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, finally, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, the iTunes Festival uh, to close the show. So uh, they announced the gearing up for another edition of, at the London Roundhouse, which is they're going to be just around the corner from where I'm speaking right now. Uh, and iTunes will bring some of the world's big biggest acts so once again on stage for a 30-day musical extravaganza that will be streamed live on iOS dev uh, devices, but also will be accessible offline via the apps and uh, by the Apple TV for a limited time. And acts confirmed so far are Mar Maroon 5, Pharrell Williams, Beck, Sam Smith, Blondie, Kylie, David Guetta, Five Seconds of Summer, Calvin Harris, and Chrissy Hine. So definitely a need for a few more rock acts uh, to join the fold. And, and Darren, I won't ask you if Alt-J are doing it, but with the album dropping on the 22nd of September, I, uh, uh, it would make a lot of sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, the schedule, of course, uh, continues to evolve until the last minute, and I really hope a few more, more uh, rock and indie bands are going to join the fold because it's it's a very pop pop lineup uh, at the moment. Uh, mm. And you know, I'm I just want to ask you guys, you know, if you have consumed iTunes Festival content uh, in the past years, and what did you think of it? Because it's it's an amazing festival. It's really well, well put together. The videos look great, but there seems to be an element of engagement that is still missing from it, at least from from what I experienced uh, in the past uh, sort of three or four years here in London, but but also from the from the South by Southwest experience. Uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on that, uh, either of you? I mean, I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my thoughts on the, I mean, it's funny this year, but, but, you know, you kind of alluded to similar where I must admit, I saw that initial round of announcements and was a little underwhelmed, if I'm honest, it felt a little bit obvious, yeah. a little bit flat. There's just, I don't know, you know, the, the, I didn't really find myself looking at it and thinking, wow, that, you know, there's a lot of exciting things on there. It just seemed like, kind of a bunch of obvious candidates, I mean, really. I, can, I can point out that that's um, usually the case, because like last year, both uh, Lady Gaga and Katy Perry, for example, were announced at the very last second, so it may okay, be that so stuff yeah, comes you never out. know, they might pull something out of the hat. Uh, not, <laughs> maybe Old J, who knows? I live <laughs> yeah. in hope. Uh, but no, I mean, it's, it's, but it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because I think the iTunes Festival is uh, kind of a, 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 a an, an odd sort of point at which iTunes exposed just how, you know, not very modern they are. You know, I mean, I read a great piece this morning just kind of saying the iTunes app is just so, like, we're totally over this, you know, and the notion that you have to sync your damn phone with it and everything about it is just kind of clunky now. It's aged very badly. And so things wedded to that experience by by default also tend to, to uh, run a risk of, of having a similar whiff about them. Yeah. And I think the iTunes Festival, to, to some extent, is like that. I don't know. I mean... I, you know, they do a good job in the sense that they very much, you know, populate it through Apple properties. So you get the app that you can watch provided you have an Apple TV and things like that. But um, I don't know. There's just something about it that feels uh, just less kind of out there than, than some other things. It doesn't feel very edgy. It feels very safe and just a, a, maybe a little bit old. 
you know, you know I, I, I just, I, no, it's like, I can't for me, quite put my finger on it. But for me, so where is the conversation happening around it? I mean, yeah, uh, it doesn't generate anything outside of like, if you're in Apple's world, then I guess it's a nice free bonus because you, you own the devices on which to watch it and things like that. But then if you're in Apple's world, you're kind of an Apple consumer anyway. And it just seems to draw a line between kind of it's all for the Apple customers and everyone else gets kind of locked out. But it doesn't really make you want to buy into the Apple ecosystem either, in my view. It's just something happening over there for those people. And and of late, you know, I think, yeah, it it, it, it feels very much to me like the tide is kind of turning on on Apple, you know, the, and, and, you know, their, their hardware is still good, but I think... In the, you know, around music generally, there is a palpable sort of sense of of desperation around what they're doing um, and trying to, you know, you can feel that the, the dominance is slipping. And I think, you know, there's, there's probably not a, a, a small amount of kind of schadenfreude going on where people are looking at it <laughs> thinking, this is quite good to see the dominant one slip because for too long, you know, maybe Apple were dictating terms around things and, and leveraging their the business rate, which... Uh, you know, we can all criticise, but that's the way business is. You yeah. know, and if you are the dominant player, you can dictate terms. That's fine. But now that's less the case. I don't know. It's just, it's that thing, isn't it, where where someone's just starting to go. Don't they look at you know? It's all looking a little bit, a little bit long in the tooth. It's not very sexy. Well, I and mean, for me, for me, it's it's still sexy. In, like uh, for the most part, I just feel like the format of the iTunes Festival itself. I mean, I, I love my Apple products, and I know for me the appeal is still there. To be honest, I, I, I've used an Android system uh, quite a bit. My, I, my mom bought one, and I, I have to keep explaining her how to use it. And it does feel even like the Nexus Five feels a lot clunkier and harder to explain than an iOS mm. device would. So in that sense, I still feel like you know, and, and some of the market share numbers from from the US are seeing it climb up. Actually, uh, prove the fact that it's still a device with a lot of appeal. But on the iTunes Festival front, it just feels like they've established the format. And they're really sticking to it in a very specific way, and they're not really experimenting too much with it, which is something that I think they, you know, they have the room to do. They have the wiggle room to do whatever they want because it's their own festival. So uh, yeah. I would like to see a bit more fun stuff happening around it, maybe extra content, stuff happening backstage, uh, uh, interviews with the artists. Uh, you know, it's all about the extra bits now. And it, it, the Archons Festival is very much focused on giving you access to the concert and that's it you don't see anything around how it's organized or you know mm. the act sound checking or anything around that which i think would really drive uh, engagement on, on, across platforms and and also perhaps even like you know itunes opening up uh, a few tidbits of, of of that content to go on to different platforms as well and, and see how that propagates uh, online too uh, ralph uh, what are your thoughts you know uh, in, in germany of course itunes is, is pretty strong uh, uh, do people watch content from the itunes festival and, and how did you react to it in the last few years I don't know exactly the numbers, but um, for me, there's like a contradiction or like a, a discrepancy between iTunes and the term of a festival in a way. <laughs> I don't think that people, um, me personally, I'm not using it um, because I'm not, I'm not using iPhones. Um, so, but as far as I know and as far as I can see the festival user experience, you know, um, Apple as a platform cannot provide what people expect to get from a festival. Right. Um, as you said, it's just the access, and um, that's not enough these days because you have compete with all these super extra customized festival experiences around you. Um, I think, um, I mean, I, I saw it at South by Southwest, right? The big bus, you know, just how to get there and get in and just blah, blah, blah. But to be honest, um, this. I don't think it's the future. <laughs> right. Unless, unless the manager should shake it up somehow. And that was the last story, the big story of the week. I can uh, just run through a couple of things. You know, I would invite people to go and check out the, a new app called Hooked, uh, the New York Times reported on it this week, uh, which allows you to create musical selfies. And they've licensed uh, a catalog of about 50 tracks and now uh, where you, uh, with the original instrumental recording. And you can record a video of yourself singing along to the track. Uh, and if you want access to the full track, you pay a, subs a monthly subscription of uh, $3.99 or £2.49 per month. So an interesting thing. Uh, 
thing uh, to look at, although if they have to do individual licensing deals for each track, it's going to take them forever to get a broad catalog, as I've experienced myself. And, uh, uh, you know, Baboom has uh, hired uh, uh, Tony Smith, uh, former director of finance for Sony Music in Australia and New Zealand, uh, and who also worked at BMG and Polygram. So, of course, the company is trying to legitimize itself uh, in the run-up to uh, an investment round and a launch uh, towards the end of the year or early 2015. So, uh, we'll see if that works. And uh, uh, finally, uh, the... Uh, had I had something else I want to say? Uh, anything else? Oh, and uh, Glenn Peoples wrote a great uh, wrap-up on uh, the sales domination of Frozen in the United States, uh, and uh, the Disney soundtrack has had a 2.15% share of album sales in the US, which is nearly four times uh, the second uh, second place uh, Beyonce album, uh, which is at 0.55%, uh, and uh, uh, the album also topped uh, the Billboard 213 times, uh, and uh, you know it's just been a, a, a smash hit, of course. Uh, the movie is uh, uh, the highest gross, uh, grossing animated movie of all times and so that's definitely helped in that region but it also shows that people are still willing to buy albums in certain conditions uh, in droves especially when kids are involved and uh, that's pretty much all for this week uh, guys uh, thanks so much again for joining me on the show again it's uh, uh, c-o-pop.de for uh, ralph and thanks ralph for for, for your time Thanks for having me on your show. Thanks, Andrea. And for Darren, it is uh, motiveunknown.com, and uh, Darren uh, provides an amazing free service, which is the Daily Digest, which arrives uh, in the afternoon, uh, every afternoon, with a short commentary and uh, a wrap-up of some of the uh, most interesting headlines in uh, digital music and uh, digital marketing. So you can check that out on motiveunknown.com. And thanks, Darren, for your time again. Good to be here. <laughs> it's a great, great to have you always. And uh, thanks so much for listening to the show. You can find out more on digitalmusictrends.com. And don't forget to go and uh, click through to the link to the one-to-one -one show. It's a little bit hidden, but it's, it is there. And every week there, I interview an interesting uh, startup or a digital music uh, company or project or anything in that, in that area on a one-to-one -one basis. And we delve a little bit deeper into what they're doing. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week. And until uh, next time.